Thank you for coming today. Um, today we're going to be talking about software analytics. So there was an earlier question, will the slides become available? I will make sure that they will become available over SlideShare. I'm not sure whether Kivi uh, has any other intentions with slides, but we'll see. And it's also being recorded, so uh, maybe it's even being shared some way. Uh, so, as I announced earlier, my name is Andy Zuidman. Um Today we're going to talk about software analytics. Um, I, explicit, I explicitly say we, because uh, I plan to talk for a little bit over an hour, like one hour twenty or something. So we have two hours, which means that 40 minutes should come from you, right? So I, I hope that there can be some interaction. Uh, I plan some interaction. We'll see how far we can get. Uh, and as we're starting early, we can always go on for 15 minutes extra, or we can go for an early drink session. I'm also fine with that. We'll see how things go. Um, so uh, today you're just seeing me, but uh, what I'm going to show you today is not only my work. I have a great team. Well, this team uh, helped me a lot with doing all the stuff that we'll be talking about today. Uh, now, what uh, I think it's always useful that we get to know each other just a bit. So let me start, and later on, uh, I'll also try to involve you. Um, so this is my natural habitat, at least for the time being. Uh, we're in the high-rise building of TU Delft. Uh, unfortunately, we are moving to another building, a smaller one. Uh, I tend to like this building, but who am I? Uh, well, who am I? Uh, I'm an associate professor in software engineering, so I'm not quite junior. I'm not quite old yet. I'm somewhere in between. Um, and uh, maybe a short perspective. Uh, I did my studies in Antwerp. I did my bachelor's, master's, and PhD over there. As of 2006, I'm working at Delft University of Technology. Uh, 2015, I gave a TEDx Delft talk on making testing fun. So if you would like to know how to do that, well, maybe you can have a look there. Uh, maybe it also becomes clear today. Uh, and in 2017, so just a few months ago, I lived for four months in Canada doing research at the University of Victoria and also spending some time at Microsoft Research in Redmond. So I think some of these IDs will also uh, become part of, um, of the presentation today, or will be part of the presentation. So this slide you already know, in case you've missed it, I'm really about quality, and quality can take many aspects. Obviously, it can be failing software, it can also be with teaching, it can also have something to do with the quality of the people, uh, it can have something to do with the quality of the code, and I think you'll see that the message that I'm trying to bring today will take a bit of every perspective and apply that to uh, the software quality perspective. Now, before we dive in, um, I have a few disclaimers to make. One, I like to tell stories. And sometimes I think the story is actually more important than the content, because that's the way that you remember the message. So that's my apology beforehand. Secondly, uh, this masterclass is actually nothing but a movie quiz, because there will be um, references to movies and TV shows throughout the presentation. And actually, I dare you, uh, please interrupt me if you would like to say which movie it comes from. And maybe even, I don't have a prize, but you can have eternal fame uh, with me if you, of course, manage to guess all the movies. Um, so that being said, um, I guess some of us are looking forward to this guy, at least my kids are. Uh, we already uh, saw... Uh, the man coming from the boat, uh, shaking hands, throwing candies. Um, maybe we're looking forward to something else. Uh, it's only three more weeks, and we can see the latest Star Wars, uh, The Last Jedi. Um, and the thing is, uh, with Star Wars, you never know what's really going on. Uh, because the dark side, right? The dark side is everywhere. And things tend to go wrong when the dark side is at work. So let's see what the dark side did in 2017. Well, early 2017, British Airways faces eight, 80 million pound, uh, pound cost for IT failure that stranded 75,000 passengers. Luckily, I was not among them. I hope for you guys, you weren't either. 
Um, but this was just a simple IT failure that made the whole IT system unavailable for some time. And a lot of passengers were stranded at Heathrow and other airports. Um, but the dark side didn't stop there because 1.25 million Dutch Ram pickup trucks had to be recalled over a fatal software glitch. Now you can say, what's a fatal software glitch? My car is not started. Is that a fatal software glitch? No. No. I don't know. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But if you read that there is one death and two injured people um, <coughs> from a simple software <coughs> glitch, well, then I'm really, I'm, I'm al almost ashamed, right? Because, I mean, I'm a software engineer and there are other people creating software that kill people. It's not the first time, it's unlikely, unlikely to be the last time, but still I think this makes us realize that we're doing more than just punching in some code and then launching an app on the App Store or the Play Store and just earning money. We have a responsibility, a responsibility towards others. Um, about responsibility to others, uh, so a glitch um, in some software system uh, at Michigan actually revealed personal data of 1.9 million people. And through that glitch, there were around 20,000 people that were either falsely accused, fined, or denied benefits. So just imagine that you go to your insurance company and you ask, well, can I get an insurance, a health insurance or something? And they say no, because in your file I can read that you have a chronic disease. So you're not uh, eligible anymore to get our insurance. And that are the th sort of things that happen through a glitch. And a glitch is an easy word, right? Because a glitch, well, everybody sees a glitch now and then. But some glitches are a bit more glitchy than others. Um, so, unfortunately, the dark side, three, us, software engineers, zero. We lost. So let's try to do better. But how to do better? Well, a wise man once told, bring balance you must, and test more you should. Um, I don't disagree. How could I disagree? But I don't disagree. Um, I turn my attention to my friend, my only friend, Google. And uh, I play the same trick. I type in how much testing and Wow, Google makes a number of suggestions. Is enough? Is too much? Is enough depends? Well, that's always the academic answer, right? So every professor that you ask a difficult question, after some thought and some size, then he says, well, it depends, right? You're always right with that answer, but that's not the answer that a data scientist is looking for, and neither is a software engineer. We want to have numbers, we want to have data, and we want to act on it. So, um, I started thinking about this, but I didn't say it depends. I said, I want to know. I want to know why, if I read dozens of blog posts, dozens of posts on fora like Reddit, Stack Overflow, and many other uh, forums, that it either says the posts or the blogs say it depends, and that's like the academic answer of the professor that it's taking too long to think about it, or, uh, you read 50% of your time. And all the other answers, and there are a few other answers, obviously, they're like 10% of the answers. And all the other answers are those two. So my question now is, why do people believe that you should be spending 50% of your time on testing? Does anybody know? I know that 23% that comes from the HP uh, uh, story, but 50% mm. I haven't heard. Okay. So apparently you're one of the 10% other answers. We just disregard that answer. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. I mean, so somehow in people's minds, the 50% lives. And it's very strange. You see this number coming back in so many blog posts and so many po uh, four posts no, and so on. Put it away and it yeah. Fine. We'll see. So the question then becomes, what is the likely origin of this 50%? I mean, we weren't born with that in our minds, right? I mean, it's not that like our mother said, you should spend 50% of your time on testing. Well, at least my mother did. 
Um, so the answer is, it comes from this book, and I think we all know this book, by Fred Brooks, The Mythical Man. It also says that adding more software engineers to a project that's already late will only make it more late, right? I mean, that's the stuff that's being discussed in this book. But Brooks also observed that 50% of time is spent on testing and debugging combined. And so this 50%, now we know where it comes from. The book uh, first appeared in 1975. So I, I wasn't born then. Um, I, I call it ancient. <laughs> I'll, I'll be careful. Uh, but so not only is it old, ancient, it is also questionable. Because it is questionable because this Fred Brooks, he walked around the corridors at IBM, and at the end of the week, he went by all the software engineers and he asked, how much time did you think you spent on testing this week? And how much did you spend on testing this week? And how much did you spend on testing this week? And then these people, they opened their Outlook. Well, no, Outlook didn't exist. <laughs> Lotus Notes. So Lotus Notes, no, they, they, uh, they, 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 they took their, their, uh, their old uh, agenda paper, on yeah. paper, probably. And they started looking, ah, oh, it should probably be 50% or something. So he wrote this down, down in this book. And uh, now we all know, through that single experiment at IBM, that testing should consume around 50% of our time. So we're kind of, um, we're kind of biased, right? I mean, this is one data point from one company more than 40 years ago, and we still all believe that. All right. So another nice book, The Leprechauns of Software Engineering. Anyone read this book by, by, by accident, by chance? No? So, pretty interesting book, nice stories in there, and it actually says, uh, it's, it's an answer to one thing, how folklore turns into fact and what to do about it. And if there's one sentence that you should remember from that book, it's this one. Lack of critical thinking has allowed wrong claims to take root in the <coughs> discipline and become entrenched. So once upon a time, you heard this associate professor from TU Delft say that you should spend 50% of your time. You don't remember anything else from the master class, but that's how you spread the word. That's how you spread the word in your company, in your organization. And this guy must have been right, right? This, he comes from TU Delft. Well, one thing, don't trust the guy from TU Delft. At least not yet. Um, so the basic question boils down to, um, even if this 50% was a correct answer, a correct estimation, would that still hold today? We, are, we have modern test frameworks. We have, we're doing Agile, we're doing Scrum. I mean, that didn't exist like 40 years ago, right? We have modern integrated development environments like Visual Studio, like uh, IntelliJ, like many others. And we're doing completely different languages. Well, not always, but still. I mean, so, yeah. Java, 40 years ago, no way. Uh, JavaScript, obviously, no. So a lot has changed. So one, a lot has changed. Two, the research, how it was done, is like a bit questionable. And I like to play this game with my kids. I tell them something, I tell it to my wife, my wife tells it to the oldest, and so on. And if the message comes back, it's not the same. It's slightly different. So even though the message from Brooks might have been spot on, it might be that it's simply not the message that we're using today to motivate our teams or to work in our team or something like that. Because um, you know who this guy is, right? Well, answer that. I mean, I asked you to answer the movie quiz. I mean, this is house, right? OK. So one of uh, uh, the rules that uh, House lives by is truth begins in lies. People, I mean, one of his catchphrases is all people lie, right? So I'm actually, I disagree. And what I'm uh, thinking here is that lies begin in truth. Because I think the truth, the 50% from Brooks, I think for that particular team, that department, the 50% was a correct observation, more or less. But the fact is that if we take this to be the ground truth that is true for every software engineering team, that is 
a lie. Because I do not think that all software engineering teams need 50%. I actually think that some need 80%, and others need 5% or something like that. So, most important thing to remember here is that it might have been true, but is it true in your context? It is very important to realize the context. And the context has shifted by 40 years or something. Right, a commercial break. Um, a commercial break because I am going to ask you, if possible, to take your smartphone or a tablet or anything else with a camera or an internet connection or both and scan this QR code. The QR code is still there. Sorry, I'm from the animal location. <laughs> but you have a computer, right? So yes, but it doesn't have an internet. Ah, here. but there's internet over there, so you can, uh, if you want. I mean, no necessity, but of it has course. A, it has a camera. Um, mm -hmm. You can use Kiwi XS, and the password is Technique. Okay. Dutch. The presenter will start the poll. Please stay tuned. Yes. So as soon as I can remove the QR code, I can go to the poll. So here it is. Um, and let's see what goes on. So now you can answer the first question. Oh, you need, you need to go back to the QR code. Uh, this is the QR code. You have to just also the URL. Uh, the URL, um, I kind of lost it, I guess. was the previous slide. Yeah, no. yeah but I cannot go back because then the results are reset. Uh, so. Even kijken of ik nog een korte versie ergens So this is the URL that you can use. Ah, this one here. I'll try to make it a bit bigger still. ch slash capital U six capital C Y. <coughs> All right. So um, ten votes. Six C one. Great. So let's uh, let's move six. on. I guess you already answered this question uh, during the. Uh, Shorter presentation earlier this afternoon. Somehow, this doesn't come as a surprise that it seems that all of you have uh, more than once encountered failing software over the past month. Who who answered this? Only once. <laughs> so I also have a Mac. I also have a Mac, but I'm interfacing. I'm interfacing with. Thanks and others. So, have you never encountered? Uh, yesterday. Yesterday. It's totally. Okay. Well, lucky you. <laughs> lucky. You. And your phone always works like you want it to. Yeah, to now. <laughs> <laughs> it's how you use it. You know. And you have yet. <laughs> it's uh, it's the context, right? Yeah. All right. Um, 
So what do you think should be done against failing software? And you can uh, tick multiple answers here. Ah, better education. Now you're, you're talking to the right person. Though. So I warned you, um, because if you uh, pick this one, something else, mm -hmm. what, what kind of issues do you want to raise then? What else should be done? At least if you have a specific thing in mind. Well, from my perspective, what I see is there is a lot of pressure on the teams that need to develop. And even if they say, we need to do this for code quality, or we have to do this first so that this will not occur, they don't get the time to do it. Mm -hmm. So that's something that needs to change. So more budget? Focus or uh, well yeah. even if the, the budget is increased, then the focus is on more functionality instead of the things that they say we should do. Yeah. It's also the mindset of the people in charge. Yeah, they, sure. they probably don't understand yeah. why or the, yeah. Yeah, the there's importance. miscommunication. They simply miss this part and they think, let's continue and then you have... They don't, the don't see the effect, yeah. I think. Uh, Obviously, sure um, you guys are, <coughs> are probably in a far better position to, to judge this. But I talked to somebody from a large copying firm and he said, well, if we don't release our software, we're not a company anymore because we go bankrupt. So even though we know that the thing that we're releasing is maybe imperfect, we need to, just for commercial reasons. And that's obviously a balancing act. Microsoft. <laughs> Microsoft as well, yeah. Absolutely. But in all honesty, I, I think, well, I'm a Mac user, but um, I also think that if you look at Windows like 15 years ago or now, it, it, you see a big improvement already. Yes, but they, the code is exploding in size, so that causes additional problems. So it sh actually, they should make it smaller instead of bigger. I mean, even the fastest PCs can't run this anymore. But you see this growth everywhere. Right? It's not only at Microsoft. You also yeah. see that at Apple or even Linux. The That's Linux true. kernel, how that has grown over 10 years, is, mm -hmm. is also huge. It used to fit on a small floppy. I know. Yeah. I, one of and now you need a large SD card to have a Raspberry Pi running. Yes. <laughs> so if we want more, then we need more code as well. So mm -hmm. maybe, maybe growth isn't really the issue. It's how you, how you cope with the growth that's actually where where the key lies to solving this. Well, if it's becoming bigger and bigger, the problem is that you don't s see where the problems are anymore. Uh, fair enough, but we, we can talk about that later offline as well. So if you think about, say, better education, because that seems to be the top answer, so what are you thinking about? Uh, anything specific, any advice to me and my colleagues on how we should do better education in, say, testing or, or quality assurance? Well, I'm lecturing uh, normally, that's my daily job, and we don't have any specific yeah, approach. It's every uh, lecturer on itself mm -hmm. who is lecturing some of his knowledge from, oh, you should use this or that to validate your software, but there's no uh, yeah, specific handbook or anything. And I can remember on the TU Delft, and as a student, we never got they never focus in this direction and then if you consider software being written for um, uh, departments uh, so within a department for project within projects and it's being used over time that there are lots of bugs and people use the software for 15 years and then over time people find out from oh there are mistakes but uh, if uh, the so software is being used at the same time for 15 years for PhD projects and mm -hmm. for all kinds of other projects, I mean, there will be a lot of mistakes in there. Yes. If people after 15 years uh, uh, only find out that there was a mistake in the beginning already. So you, you just invalidated 15 years of research. Yes. That's what you're saying. Oh, and very good if point. I compare it, uh, so one of my colleagues uh, who was also from Delft, uh, he went to Numeca, which is a Belgian company mm -hmm. for. Uh, um, uh, uh, flow simulations for uh, 
aerodynamics and um, then he was describing that they were doing 80 tests on the software to check uh, things about the grid size and all um, basic points and then I was thinking from we were doing that on the Theodolf and he was also yeah, think, yeah, saying that this didn't happen there. Yeah. So I think that education should improve because we never got those tools. I fully agree, and I'll, I'll try to uh, divulge a bit about what we're currently doing, mm -hmm. but maybe there are any other uh, mm -hmm. things that need to be <coughs> highlighted here? Because, I mean, eight of you said better education, so what should we improve? I think... Uh, yeah. yeah. I was thinking more of the... Uh, actually, there are a lot of acting software engineers who are not actually educated in software engineering. So I think that a lot of companies need to improve their education within the company, more trainings, more policies, maybe, maybe even standardization within the company to realize what they want to achieve with their software and what their software engineers or acting software engineers in this case. Very good point. Anything that you want to add? Uh, I think uh, education is mainly focused now on uh, what, what I see in my company is that uh, the engineers get the training, software developers get the training, management get the training about the concepts. Um, but uh, most is focused on, on get that software running and get to get CI CD, get to get DevOps. Uh, but it's not focused, uh, at least the trainings we see and we get, uh, uh, having uh, the budgeting rounds, having it uh, uh, in a more iterative way, not planning two years in advance. Um, and having <coughs> times, okay, at that point of time we need this and we and uh, at this point of time this and we distributed over 20 teams and they are all integrated. All those kind of ways of thinking is not mitigated, it's not educated and, and uh, it's taken uh, the company to a new plan for how to get out of that uh, situation. Mm -hmm. So uh, whatever you teach the engineers and the, and the developers uh, they will still have to deal with with the uh, with the uh, uh, reality, reality, and the, the train that drives them in a different way. Yeah. So, I think well, all three are, are very interesting answers. But I think um, so. One common thing that I'm kind of feeling, uh, either explicitly or between the lines, is uh, <coughs> mindset. Mm -hmm. If you do not have the right mindset, you can work on software, keep on developing, and think you're finished without actually having verified that you're done. I mean, that you've tested, that you've validated it. Um, so one thing that we're currently doing uh, in, in the first year, uh, the first quarter, uh, they get a uh, programming language, Java. From week three onwards, if they hand in something that doesn't contain tests, we're not looking at it anymore. And then students are saying, well, you want me to test five lines of code. Uh, why? Because I can see that this works. And I say, well, maybe you can see it, but I want to see proof as well. I want to see the green bar from your J unit. I want proof. And I want you to have the right mindset that even if you're producing this one line of, of one line tiny code, that your reaction is, I should, I should test this. And not, uh, I don't care because I know it's right. And that's. I think it's a human fallacy that you are sometimes overconfident in the things that you're producing. And I think that's something that we'll see throughout the presentation. In, in practice, I see a c in a current situation is that uh, even though the developers want to do that, they are forced not to. So they are frustrated with the product that they're delivering. They are saying it's not completed and that's brought to production, uh, having vulnerabilities in, in production in the app. Okay, so the mindset months. is there, but it's the yeah. organization yeah. that's holding them back. That's not, uh, not accepting it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. At the university, I saw that yeah, people are doing some tests, mm. but not everything what's necessary. So if you compare it uh, yeah, with Numeca, which was doing a lot of tests, and then uh, the groups where, which I've seen, uh, how they, they, they try to do this, but it's not enough. You see, they do a million. If you have any suggestions, yes. we need to talk later on, definitely. Yes, let's talk. All right. Um, so let's move on to the uh, next question, and you can cast your votes. So when I program, I'm not sure how much programming you still do, 
but when I program, I spend approximately, and the answer goes from 0% to more than 50% in uh, to some degrees. So I am wondering how much time do you think you're spending on testing? Wow. I guess nobody dares answer something lower than the, the highest number here, right? Okay, we have some. I think you must all be thinking this guy wants us to test 50%, so that's what we should <laughs> So again, 50% shows up. Let's see. We'll see later on how much guys you are actually testing. Um, right, so another two questions, no, another three questions. Um, so you notice a bug, or one of your colleagues comes to you and he says, I found a bug. So what is the first thing that you do? Uh, you immediately start up your debugger. You immediately write a test to replicate the bug or you start writing print S statements throughout your software to see what goes wrong. And you can actually take multiple answers here as well if you want. Because the one doesn't exclude the other, obviously. All right. So a lot of print F fanatics. I also like that. I think it's very good. But I also have to say, I think the debugger is a very powerful tool, and especially in distributed systems, it actually might just save the day. Um, but we'll I'll also talk about a bit on that later on. So let's go to our before last question, if the software wants to work. Let's talk about DevOps. So the three answers that you can give is DevOps is nothing but a buzzword. I put it into practice daily, or I need more post-deployment data. Are any of you doing DevOps, by the way? I see some people shaking their heads no. Okay, fine. You can skip this question. All right. It is nothing but a buzzword. It seems to stand out. I kind of get where you're going, but let's also see what the next question brings. The next question is on continuous integration and continuous deployment. Uh, and actually, what I'm asking from you is, I typically don't use it. I use it in most of my projects. I live by it. It allows my team to test all the way. Testing is not the key part of continuous integration or deployment. I also do internal software quality checks with my continuous integration pipeline. And finally, I also do security checks during my CI, CD. <coughs> So the top answer seems to be, you're not using it. My question is why? Why are you not using it? Is there a cultural problem in the company or is it more you don't see the benefits or anyone would like to discuss? You don't have the tooling for it? Might also be a good answer. No, I don't have the tool. No, okay. I've, um, seen, I've, seen, I've seen it, that it exists. But. And do you see the benefits of it? For sure, of course, of course. I mean, your, your I think it's number one tool, the number one tool you should have. Okay. So. But your organization... No. No. Okay. Okay. Any other anecdotes? Uh, for an anecdote, we, what we implemented is security checks. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing is, what, what we had is the management saying, oh, we don't need the security test, we do a pen test every half year, releasing every two weeks for multiple teams, but uh, so that's good enough. And by the way, we never are attacked, right? We know <laughs> that we have never no attacks. So we put these uh, security checks uh, in, in, uh, in place, mm -hmm. mitigate a lot of uh, attacks, uh, possibilities, but then, 
we also start um, security monitoring in place on every endpoint we have. And within two weeks, we saw that we have actually customers trying to impersonate other customers. I'm <laughs> and of course, people do that. But um, up until then, the management didn't believe that even though we have two million customers, there was no one customer doing this. But now we have actually proof that people are doing, so trying which, to do which, this. Can I ask which company are you working for? Aegon. So it's it's really yeah. I, it was for me. It was I'm, I was very lucky for me that it actually happened. So now they understand that automating security in the CI/CD pipeline and in the monitoring pipeline is very important, and and that it really saves time. So one anecdote that I can tell you here about uh, continuous integration and, and deployment is that ING is I think this is known. They're moving towards. Uh, automating the entire release pipeline drastically. Uh, and it's also why, for example, um, in Belgium, they have kind of fired like the whole IT department, because now it can be done by others. And a lot of the deployment, which was what the Belgian IT was doing, is now just done in Amsterdam. It's just push of a button, everything is automated, and it's released and deployed, and also the Belgians can benefit from ING. So, it's not only about this cost saving, but it's also about having this insurance and also installing this culture of making sure that everything is tested before it is released to the customer. And even then, I mean, um, I guess I shouldn't say, but even a bank like ING sometimes has issues with their online banking. And uh, while you only had one opportunity to see fa a failure on your screen recently, I mean, I've had it a number of times with my bank, so it still happens, obviously. All right, so I'm glad that uh, I also got to know you a bit more and your ideas about um, uh, testing and continuous integration and DevOps and so on. So now we can end our commercial break and dive in just a bit deeper again. So uh, if I put it very black and white, what we currently have, at least during the presentation, during the masterclass, we know that there is folklore, or maybe we can call it evidence, maybe, that people tend to test approximately 50% of your time. Now, the good thing is, you kind of acknowledge this, right? Because the top answer was, we are testing more than 50%. So I, this really works to my benefit, and we'll see why. But the reality is that science, and actually also practice, doesn't know. We don't know because we haven't measured it. Really, right? So let's see. So what do we do now? Well, either we send out a massive number of questionnaires to uh, all people in the organization and we ask them to take how much time do you think you're sp spending on testing. Actually, I just did that trick, right? I asked you online and you all ticked something. Well, we also did that. We did that with 2,443 developers from 68 countries over two and a half years. But on the other hand, uh, what is the real and most objective way of knowing how much you're testing? And that is actually something that our, our friend, uh, Mr. De Mol, uh, came up with. That's called Big Brother, right? Like, right? So we install cameras everywhere, even in the bathroom. And we... 1984, right? What? 1984. <laughs> 19, yeah, exactly. Um, and we check your every move like what you do in the bathroom, in the bedroom, behind your computer. We check everything. We know when you're testing. And all the rest, we don't care. Uh, at least I don't care. Um, so yeah. we did both. We did both. And uh, so we played Big Brother for 2,443 software engineers, both in the industry and open source. We observed some of them, not all of them, some of them for two and a half years. Um, we did this for Java and C Sharp. And we did it for four IDEs. We did it for IntelliJ. We did it for Android Studio, which is a kind of variant of IntelliJ. We did it for Eclipse. And we did it for a smaller portion, but still for Visual Studio. Now, this infrastructure uh, that we used does, isn't called Big Brother. We call it Watchdog. But it is like Big Brother inside your IDE. So we instrument everything in Visual Studio, Eclipse, and the others. And we measure everything that you do. Well, 
we only look at your testing. And in the process, what we actually did is we collected 161 man years of software development. Think about that. If you're a software engineer, how much time are you actually spending on coding? It's not like 100%, right? No. So this actually means a lot of people that we followed for a lot of the time, because this is the time that they were spending inside their IDE. So inside the Visual Studio, Eclipse, or whatever. A lot of uh, man years of development. And we focused on one thing. We focused on developer testing, which we can somehow also say unit testing. It's a bit more broad, but let's say unit testing. Let's keep it simple. And during the installation, we asked, can we ask you some questions? And what kind of questions did we ask? Well, the most important thing is, um, do you test? And Everybody said, yes, we test. In reality, they did, but <laughs> they said they did. And then we asked them, how much time do you think you're spending on testing? So instead of the multiple uh, choice question that you got, they actually got a slider. They got a slider, and they could slide it from 0% to 100%. Or you could just leave it in the middle for 50, right? Uh, so this took less than two minutes to install, but in the meantime they answered us uh, these questions. And um, I'll make it very easy on you. Um, I picked two answers. And one answer is uh, most people, or, or, or people on average said 50-50, or people on average said 30-70. So if you believe that we are indeed at the 50-50, the magic number 50, please raise your hand right now. Okay, so four people, half of the room. Can I ask to also raise your hand if you believe it's this? You didn't raise your hand. No, yeah, that's true. So what do you think? Well, at least I, I, if the slide is not changed, then people don't uh, haven't answered the question, I think. Uh, but uh, so that's why I don't, didn't vote for 50-50, and uh, it, I, for me it totally depends on what code I write. But if that's the academic answer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 are you an academic? Uh, no, no. No, then you I cannot give that answer. Oh, sorry. sorry. No, 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 no. I mean, we said I that only good be... academics say it <laughs> yeah, we're, okay. not, we're not doing that game. Today. Okay, so what could the effect? It's okay. Yeah. Um, so. This is what people answered. So this is simply from the questionnaire, the 2,443 software engineers. They said, we spend 49% of our time on engineering test code and 51% on engineering production code. That's strange, right? Because all the time I'm saying this 50% and we don't know where it comes from, but apparently it lives in people's minds in some way. And then, when I ask you the question, but like a few minutes ago... There's a difference in writing test code uh, and testing. Yes, so what we asked is explicitly the engineering part. So not the running, not yeah. the engineering part. Yeah. So um, this, in a way, looks very much like your answer that you gave during the commercial break. Because a lot of people were saying like 50%. Not all, some people were also saying 20, 25, but 50%, well, seems to be coming back. So reality is slightly different. It's not only slightly different, it's vastly different. You are, these people, these 2,443 software engineers, they were spending 28% of their time on engineering testing. And most of the people, and that's what the graph shows, were obviously overestimated. Now, you can say um, people were keeping up appearances because people knew they were being tracked. People knew they were being tracked. So they, were, they uh, knowingly participated in an experiment on testing, so they, they thought, I'm going to do more test engineering. That could be true. But we eliminated all participants that... Um, of which we could not record at least three months of data. So all people that participated and spent less than three months uh, in, with our tool, we discarded that data, simply to make sure 
that this is representative data. So, this is the estimation, this is reality. Now, another good question that you can ask, is there a difference between the IDE or the programming language that you're using? Answer, yes. But differences are extremely small. So, the variance that we saw here is between 25 and 29%, depending on which IDE. Average, 28%. So, it's very close. So you could not say that, say, Visual Studio, which is maybe used more in professional environments, that they do more testing than somebody who does open source development with Eclipse. That doesn't seem to be the case. But we didn't stop at that. There were some other very interesting observations still. Because what we saw is that from all the projects that we tracked, around 50% were doing unit testing. So let's see, you get an invitation, either through Twitter, LinkedIn, or you simply bump across our website, or you go to the Eclipse Marketplace and you see, hey, there's this plugin for testing that researchers are using to track my testing activities. So let's install my big brother inside my IDE. Let's do that. And then you come to the conclusion that only 50% of those that installed it are actually doing testing. I find that remarkable. All right, in Tesco writing test code. So likely this is an underestimation and I think there are far less projects doing testing, doing writing test code as you correctly say than this 50% number. Now for those projects where we did see unit test code in the IDE, we also saw that almost half of the developers did not execute, read or modify a single test within five months. <laughs> So 50% doesn't care to test at all. And then another half of that population, uh -uh, no executing, no reading, and no modifying of test code. Now you can say that person modified a lot of production code and thought the test code was still beautiful and great and didn't need any change. That could be, but it is still questionable. Whether it's good or not, I don't know, because we didn't specifically look at the changes. We uh, couldn't do that. So you also observed the, the repository? No, no, we did not. Okay. Because so obviously... Maybe someone else was writing it. That could be, but obviously um, if you install such a tool and, we, and you tell that person, well, we're transferring your whole code base to our servers to analyze it, well, then I guess we would not have 2,443 people uh, that installed the tool. So, no, the answer is no. Um, now, one thing uh, that uh, I learned by talking to companies uh, is that an often heard answer to why people are not testing or not executing their tests is because they take too long to execute. Now, I was at Microsoft, and I, this was the second time I was at Microsoft, and people at Microsoft often say, it takes so long to execute my tests. So typically what they do, they, they start to run in the evening and then they come back in the morning and they look at the number of failed, or they look at the failed tests and they start doing something about it. Um, so we were like very interested in knowing how much time it actually takes to execute those tests. And uh, just to uh, put some extra emphasis on, on the importance of this problem is that if you look at Microsoft Visual Studio 2013, if I'm right, they incorporated a feature there to run your tests more quickly because the, the uh, Visual Studio actually analyzes which tests are affecting the code that is being changed. Uh, Test Impact Analyzer, I think that's, that's the official name. Uh, to, speed up, to speed up the execution of the test. So this is apparently a real problem for some people. So that is where my uh, next question for you guys comes from. Do you think that executing a, a, a normal run that developers initiate, does that take less than five seconds or equal or more than five seconds? So who thinks it's this? Then please raise your hand. Including the optimizer of excluding it. We don't know. We don't know. We did not investigate. Okay. And the only thing that I can say is that of the four IDEs that we actually uh, tested, only Visual Studio has this by default. Yeah. Eclipse, there is a plugin, but 
it's not installed by default. So who thinks executing your tests takes less than five seconds? Five. Perfect. It is the right answer. Tests, tests are incredibly quick. They take like half a second. There's no reason not to do it, right? Half a second, it's like that's, uh, you blink with your eyes and it's done. So there's no reason not to execute your tests. <coughs> um, but that's not the complete story. Because Microsoft throws a lot of money at this special feature to optimize your tests. But actually what developers are doing themselves is they do test selection by themselves. They know I've made this change so I should execute this test or this subset of tests. So the number the median number of tests being executed in one run is below 10. Those are 10 tiny tests that are being run, and those are obviously incredibly quick as well. So developers have a very good vision or a very good understanding of which tests should be executed. Maybe not perfect, but at least good enough to get an initial feedback, initial feedback inside the ID. Now, Another observation that we make is that around 60% of the test executions in the IDE fail. Um, would, you, would you consider that troublesome or would you consider that a good sign? So who thinks this is a good sign? Okay, yeah. Who thinks it's a bad sign that so many tests are failing? Why? It's not very well programmed then. No. The quality of programming True. Should, uh, should increase. True. Okay. But I'm, I, on the other hand, I'm glad that people are executing their tests because they're finding it out before it reaches the customer. All right? Before it reaches you on your iPad and you see the failing of the website. So I understand your, uh, your idea there. Uh, I was actually hoping that somebody would say, well, this is obvious, right? Because people are doing test-driven development. Yeah, they're writing a test well. first, they're making it fail, and then they're writing production code that will ensure that the test is not failing anymore. Reality is different. We'll see that. Reality is different. So the only thing that you need to remind yourself of is that a lot of failing tests is actually maybe a good thing. Because it, it, it allows you to see it before it reaches the customer. And a failing test is far more interesting than a succeeding test. A failing test, you can learn something from it. If, it, if your test always succeeds, it's actually a test that you can delete. Because and, it will and, not and if you're saying, if you combine this information with the information you say that the people are not editing the test most of the time. Yes. yes. It actually means that, that they're not trying to write the, the test to, to succeed the code they already written, but it means they, they write the code so that the test will succeed. So that the, the, if the test is written properly, the code should execute properly. Yeah, but I don't agree, actually. Your test case is also not 100% uh, no. the representation no, of, of the reality. Sure. So That's also abstraction yeah. and also the people mistakes. Yeah. So you can then go focusing on your programming such that your test will not fail, mm -hmm. but that's not the way. Yeah. So it depends. It depends. <laughs> I'm, I'm, we're going to move on just a bit, but this is an interesting discussion. And when we round up this part of the presentation, I'll come back to it. So um, another thing, another observation, 85% of the development sessions, and what's a development session from opening your Eclipse? to shutting it down or closing your laptop, both are possible, we observed that in 85% of those development sessions, no tests were run. Tests were written, but they were not run. So why would you write them, but not use them? Hmm. We'll get back to that. Now, TDD is not widely practiced. Programmers who claim to do it are not doing it. Neither strictly nor even loosely. Now, um, for the TDD aficiendos, there is this uh, YouTube channel, Let's Developer, it's called, 
It's a German guy who vlogs about his experiences doing TDD. So this was our ideal candidate <laughs> to play Big Brother on, right? So we, ins we asked him to install the plugin. And um, obviously this guy came out on top, right? He came out on top in terms of how much time he does TDD. Um, I'm not going to ask you to guess, but even in his case, the amount of time that he was doing TDD is like low. It's like 20% of his time he was doing TDD. So we asked, come on. I mean, you are Mr. TDD, and then we see that you are not doing it. And he says, well, in many cases, it's just too difficult to think about a test before you write the production code. It is extremely different, difficult. So TDD can also, it's, it's very unlikely to be the answer why 60% of the tests are failing. All right. Everybody lies, right? People lie about how much time they spend on testing and how much time we actually measure on testing. I also lie. Because up until now, I've told you this presentation was going to be about software analytics or maybe test analytics. But actually, this was not about that at all, right? This is just a research presentation that I'm giving you to impress, um, to, to get impressed about the research that you delved. And that was, I mean, the title was just like, to lure you here. Uh, so I promised this, and I gave you none. <laughs> well, the reality is actually different. How did we manage to have 2,443 people install a research plugin? Well, the answer is because we used software analytics as bait. So our tool was actually a software analytics tool that we used as a basis to do our research on. But the people who installed this tool got an overview after using the tool for at least two months. So that they could not, or that their knowing of the results could not influence our measurements. Uh, but it is really important that people get an intrinsic motivation to participate in this kind of research. So that's where the software analytics comes in. And this is what uh, we gave to them. We gave them an overview of how much time they're spending on different things of the development uh, process. And we also gave, the, gave them the opportunity to uh, compare themselves. This is the value from, uh, for the individual developer. And this is the value for the entire population. And uh, if we worked together with a company, there was a third column uh, in between and they could compare themselves against their colleagues to see how am I doing in terms of testing compared to my colleagues. And so we got some interesting uh, anecdotal uh, um, uh, insights from some developers. Because one developer says, I was actually estimating to be spending 20% of my time on an engineering test code. But in reality, it's only 6%. So making people aware is actually one of the big benefits of software analytics. People have a general feeling like, hey, I'm doing so much on this and so much on that. But I'm also going to um, uh, relate this to other situations. Like when I tell my kids, please clean up your room, they always say, well, I don't like to do that, daddy. I want to play games. I want to watch TV and so on. And then, I, then I, my answer is, ah, come on, it only takes 10 minutes and then your room is done and then you can still watch TV. And they say, no, 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 the cleaning up my room takes at least an hour, maybe one and a half hours, maybe two hours. And I mean, that's the arguments that they use, right? Um, now, when we saw all the, these, these insights, like people are estimating uh, to be spending like 50% of their time on testing, in reality, it's only it's like half. Um, we, um, we started looking into uh, psychology literature and it seems that if you ask people to do an estimation of something they don't like, they're always going to overestimate it by a lot, right? So if, if I tell my wife I don't want to do the dishes because this is going to take me like uh, an hour and then in reality it will only take me like 15 minutes maybe, but it's just something I don't like to do. That's why we uh, bought a dishwasher. Um, <laughs> 
But I think you got the point. Uh, a lot of people don't like the test. A lot of people don't like the test because it is about breaking something that you built yourself. You're, you're, you're proud of what you built and, and now you need to devise a way to break it. Uh, so something that we're currently doing, uh, and I don't have slides on it, but it's maybe something that I can talk about just a bit, is that uh, we're looking at the kind of tests that people are writing. Are people writing positive tests, like affirmative tests? Like if you punch in 5 and 5 and you uh, press the addition button on a calculator, then you're expecting 10, right? That's a positive test. It's, it's an affirmation of something that you expect to go right. But um, you can also uh, try to go for negative tests. And what could be a negative test if you think about a calculator? It could be a division by zero, right? Are you actually testing that a division by zero that, that doesn't result in some kind of number, but in an error or uh, not a number or something like that? Or are you testing the, the unexpected? And when we um, started looking into that, we found that, um, uh, and still these results are preliminary, that more than 80% of the tests are actually affirmative tests. They mm -hmm. test the expected. But the unexpected things, like you entering uh, a character when you're asked to uh, enter your age, like uh, age uh, A, well, people don't test for that, right? And that is where a lot of things actually can go wrong. Wait, but so you mentioned, okay, so test for the unexpected, but then it, it comes down to the very first stages of any kind of system development where you try to come up with use cases and, and yes. try to brainstorm and, and stuff like that. But in that case, they are not so much unexpected. I, I did, did crash a robot once. was uh, invited by IBM to uh, observe their new clouds and stuff like that, and they had some well, the, the uh, robot from China, a large robot that can talk to you and interact with you with a screen on his body. And uh, so it started asking me questions because that was the, the drill. And I was answering them totally unexpected. Like, if it, what's your name? Uh, then I uh, would say Rotterdam. Uh, what do you would to do today? Uh, I would say, uh, I'm a computer, right? Stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And it crashed. It, after three qu questions, it t literally crashed on me. So uh, I can then uh, touch the screen and switch, uh, etc. I could hack it. but. So, yeah, that's is if you uh, don't, uh, if you do only uh, test expected things. So, I, I think you're raising a, a, a good point. But the problem is, there are <coughs> a limited number of right solutions or right possibilities, and there are often an unlimited number of wrong options. Now, just Imagine you go out uh, to buy a car tomorrow. And then, what are you looking for in this car? Where well, you're looking that the car has four wheels, right? That's what we expect, the car has four wheels. You're expecting five seats, four doors, uh, an engine, um, and what else? Um, well, let's take that as a basic <coughs> set. But what you're not looking for is whether there are any leaks is there oil leaking? Well, maybe if you're really into engineering, you might, but a, re a regular person will not go and look underneath the car whether there's any leak. Um, you will not be looking whether there's a, a spare tire, because while well, you're in awe of the car, the nice Ferrari that you want to buy, you're not going to look whether there's a spare tire. So I think the point that I'm trying to make is that it is far easier to come up with these affirmative tests than it is with the negative test. So even if you have your use cases, and even if you can apply them at the unit test level, it is far more difficult to eliminate all these corner cases. It is also infeasible, in a way. And it is about making choices. Which are the most important tests? Which are the most, the tests that are most likely to catch something going wrong? Right. Um, so, the takeaways, uh, and these are just the intermediate takeaways, so there's still a bit to go. Um, asking is not measuring. And I think the evidence there is clear. Asking is important. Measuring is equally important. Be critical towards folklore, uh, because there might just be this leprechaun, right? So, 
it might be that the core is true, but you should ask yourself, is that still valid? Has something changed? Like, has the development practices or tools changed? And very important as well, is it true in your context? Like, is it true in your organization? Now, estimating is difficult, especially if you don't like to do it, uh, like doing the dishes or something. Um, but, and this uh, you already heard during the earlier presentation, there might be a problem. Um, and the problem is exactly privacy. Because what we're measuring comes very close to measuring productivity. And just as I said earlier, in the German uh, legal system, this would not be allowed. So um, I'm not sure whether it caught your eye, but one of my team members is from Germany. He has a lot of industrial contacts there. And so he tried to sell our tool to a lot of his friends working in industry, and they said, well, I want to help you, but do you realize that you're actually asking me something that's illegal? Because in Germany, people, you, you cannot just measure how much, how productive they are, which, I mean, we have maybe this vision that German industry is, is, is incredibly productive, but apparently you cannot measure it, at least not measure it without people knowing it and agreeing to it and so on. So this might be a great tool, right? I mean, we want to do software analytics for all and install it all over the world on every computer, uh, but it's not that easy. It needs to get acceptance within your organization as well because people might be afraid. People might be afraid that if there is a bug, a catastrophic bug that costs an Amazon outage for one hour and that costs so many millions of loss to Amazon that it can actually be traced back to you. Right? Because you, you might be the person that just didn't write tests that day. The day that everything went to release and caused this catastrophic failure. So it's not so easy. And it's easier said than done. So yes, we do have a problem. So all your participants are not from Germany or German firms? I haven't said that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the CDD guy was doing it. But he works at a university, so maybe different kinds of people. No. So, yes, we have a few people from Germany, uh, but their employer was not, uh, they informed. was not informed. Yes. And obviously this is on a voluntary basis, but they did, um, especially uh, the German people, but also other people, asked whether this would be shared with their employer. <laughs> and I think that's... Um, that's a sensible question to ask, obviously. And we did not share it. Um, all right. Now the question is, are we getting the complete picture? And the obvious answer is no. Uh, so let's do what um, our Dr. House does best, and let's do a differential diagnosis. We have several symptoms. And symptom one is in 85% of development sessions, no tests were run. That's like a lot, right? So, yet uh, 65, well, I adjusted the number to 60, 60% 60 of test executions in the IDE fail. So if we know that not a lot of uh, execution of tests is actually happening, but if they're executed, a lot of them fail, where's, I mean, what's happening, right? If people are releasing software, and it seems to work in most cases, at least for some of us. I'm sorry to be always pointing at you. Um, so the differential diagnosis is tests are written but not run. Then that doesn't really make sense to me. Tests are written but they're run on the command line or in another environment. Or finally, tests are written but they're run in continuous integration. Now, I would be happy with either, well, not the first, but with the other two, I would be happy. But I would also be a bit concerned because if you do it on continuous integration, there's a much longer feedback cycle. Normally, if you do it in your IDE, you punch the button, 0.54 seconds, and you have your green or red bar, so you know what you have to do. It can but be a pre-commit hook as well. It can also be a pre-commit hook, ab uh, absolutely. So um, we wanted to know what goes on between the IDE and continuous integration because we do not know what's we didn't instrument the entire computer, only the IDE, so we don't know what's going on in the command line or some private server or something like that. 
So uh, we started looking into Travis CI, uh, analyzed uh, 2.6 million builds, two programming languages, um, around 2,300 uh, projects, all open source projects. And what we saw, luckily, is that a majority, a large majority, is actually concerned with testing because they have an explicitly defined testing phase in their CI cycle. 18% does not. They're using CI for some other reasons. And what we saw is that uh, these are the number of builds that show at least one failing test. So for Java, around 10% of builds fail. For, Py uh, for Ruby, around 20% of uh, builds fail due to a failing test. Uh, but then if we look at what the number one reason is for a uh, build to break, then we see that in more than half of the cases, the build breaks because one of the tests, or one, one or more of the tests, are actually failing. And the other failures could be security related, could be because the, um, the code style guidelines are not adhered to, and so on. Um, but luckily, and I think this is most importantly, what we saw is that people configure their continuous integration to fail if a test fails. Because you can actually switch that off. You can say, well, maybe one failing test is still OK. No. Luckily, 98.3% of the projects actually consider uh, testing to be an integral part of, uh, of continuous integration. So that's, I guess, the good news. Um, and something else, um, what we found interesting, is that uh, in 60% of the uh, uh, projects, we found that if they integrate in multiple environments, like you build it for Windows, and you build it for Linux, and you build it for macOS, that in 60% of those projects, a test failed in at least one of the environments. So it is incredibly important not only to test for like one platform, but if you want to make sure that this works on multiple platforms, that you also integrate it and test it on those multiple platforms. So, if we put everything together, and we see 60% failing tests in the IDE, and less than 20% failing tests in continuous integration, there must be somewhere, some magic being done in the middle. Because you cannot go from 60% failing tests in IDE to less than 20 in the CI. Now, obviously, disclaimer, we are not looking, we're not necessarily looking at the same projects. Because we didn't know exactly which projects that use CI were also part of our investigation inside the IDE. But still, what we heard from a lot of people is that people use the command line or some built-like tool locally to execute their tests so that they have rapid feedback, but they can keep on developing inside the IDE. And a logical assumption, we don't know, is obviously that these tests, they probably run the entire batch of tests, probably take longer than the 0.54 seconds that we witnessed inside the IDE. So is there a consequence if you just execute it on continuous integration instead of the IDE? Yes, there is, um, because the, uh, especially if you're a non-paying customer of such a CI environment, there is a delay of between 12 and 15 minutes before receiving the feedback, simply through scheduling of other projects. So that is probably not ideal. All right, but imagine. Um, we're doing software analytics. And uh, we're creating an analytic for testing. We're creating another analytic for uh, software quality. Uh, we're creating another uh, analytic for uh, your scrum cycle, where, whether you're doing well or not. And you get a lot of images, visualizations, data to process, right? So you kind of get overwhelmed by good intentions, because, I mean, there's value. But it becomes difficult to see the trees in the forest. Um, so what then? What happens then? Um, well, the question is, should you trust your gut? Or should you really depend only on metrics and analytics and so on? Um, 
And for the people that are really into movies, now really comes the big bang of the movies, because I'm going to ask you, for which movie is this? I know the name in Spanish. Well, go ahead in Spanish. Perfume de Mujer. I think I, I hear a lot of familiar uh, words. Yeah, I think it's that. So. I didn't watch it in English yet. OK. Does anybody know the movie? It's from 94, I guess, or 94? It's a long time ago. I've seen it, but I don't remember the name. Can you tell what's, what's it about? Um, I think um, the, the, the person who writes, he's a cool girl or so, and he's blind, and then uh, this guy, um, uh, for some reason, he had, uh, is assisting him, um, and then in the end, he has to drive this Ferrari, and... You saw the and, movie. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so the movie is called Scent of a Woman. And um, as you correctly state, uh, this is an army, a retired army colonel. Uh, he's blind, but he has a special gift. And his special gift is that he can, uh, he knows the perfume of everyone. So he sees or he smells this perfume and he says, oh, you're wearing, I don't know, Chanel number no. five, because that's the only perfume I know. Um, and can I dance with you and so on. So he's a real romantic, well, I think. Um, and th so the, uh, why I'm, I'm putting in this image and, and this idea of, of, um, of smells is actually that a lot of us have a pretty good nose, a pretty good nose when it comes to software engineering practices. And obviously I can, I can go back to this, right? All the graphs, all the metrics, all the data, we could be spending like a day to analyze this, but sometimes having this, this person in your group, or a lot of these persons in your group, is actually more valuable. And one doesn't exclude the other, right? I mean, sometimes you need the data, and from the data, you need the person or the persons with the good nose that know how to smell things. Um, so, we also tried this in a way, um, and we actually tried this with code spells, so there's an even stronger relationship with scent of a woman. Um, but what is a code smell? Uh, a code smell is actually a kind of symptom in source code that points to something that is not perfect, in a way. So, a, uh, probably a, a, a very well-known code smell is a long method. So if you're programming and you're writing multiple screens of code within one method, well, that's probably not something that you should do. Can we agree on that as a kind of baseline? Well, yes, it's also related to that. So um, what we could do, and some tools do that, uh, like Code Climate or um, some others, uh, they point like this method is too long, it has some kind of red symbol somewhere, and then you should act upon that, and you should do something about it, and so on. Uh, now we tried to go in a completely different direction. We stepped away from um, the purely uh, metric-based detection of uh, these code smells, and we tried to do it in a much more intuitive way. And what did we do? Uh, we we're thinking that a uh, regular uh, software engineer uh, will not start counting lines, will not launch a tool and, and uh, see, well, are there, is this too long? No, no, that's okay. No, no you don't do that. Maybe you do, uh, but I don't. Um, so the question then becomes, is there another way, a more intuitive way of detecting things that become too long or too messy or too complex? And what we started looking at is the different words being used. So if you use a very limited set of uh, identifier names for your methods and your variables and, and your attributes and so on, then you should have something that's compact, that's concise, that's easily to be expressed. While if you use like a lot of words at the beginning, and then you start using another vocabulary somewhere in the middle to finish with another vocabulary towards the end, then maybe it's too long because you're doing three things within one entity, and maybe that's not what you want. So um, um, we try to 
distinguish the purely metric based approach and obviously if you see a method that has more than 600 lines and 64 nest statements there's no doubt right I mean the metrics are right this is too long this is too complex and I would just delete it and start over but that's me um, but we are not sure whether that's really the thing that matters um, so again we looked at this more intuitive way of, of looking at these smells uh, and what we actually saw is that a number of smells that would go undetected with the metric based approach are actually considered to be really bad people say well this is like bad while people say oh well I have this method of like 120 lines of code and everything seems to be okay because this is a coherent method everything belongs together I could not see a better way to split this up this seems fine um, so we started talking to people we uh, we looked at code uh, we looked at a lot of code because we looked throughout the history of 20 software projects and all of these software projects existed for at least five years, some of them even 10 or 11 years. And so what we started doing is we started looking at which of these smells are more likely to be refactored. So what did we do? We ran through all these projects and their entire history, looking for metrics and looking for the more intuitive notion of bad code. And what we saw is that all the, the, the methods or all the entities that are affected by smells through a metric based approach they are not touched <coughs> they just leave it like it is they make changes if necessary but they will not refactor them yet if people come across a method that according to us is affected by this more intuitive understanding of the smell people are much more likely to refactor it so in more than half of the cases the intuitive smells are removed. In less than 10% of the cases, the metric-based smells are removed, simply because people do not pick up on them, or maybe because they're not that important. So having all these, and, and this is the, the, the more high-level message, having all these metrics, it's great, but sometimes it's too much, and sometimes people know better, because they, the intuition they have is actually far more important than the number. So how do you, can I ask a question? Sure, obviously. How do you communicate in that then? Because your metrics is something to communicate to others. Your intuition, how do you communicate that? That's a very good, very good question. So to be completely honest, we're not there yet. This is fresh. We finished this three months ago. Um, we did talk to a number of people. And again, uh, you're absolutely right. They also say we need to have some kind of thing to show, to show to team members, to show to my manager, because I, I cannot go on and refactor until intuitively I'm done. Um, so what we're currently doing is uh, we're trying to devise um, a smelliness factor, <laughs> which then goes from zero to 100. And on that scale, uh, we're saying, well, we think this is like an 80% smelly method. And our current feel, but again, we're not there yet, is that everything above the 60% should actually be taken care of. There's something should be done. And everything below is probably fine. You can define it. Yes. But we, so we're trying to see whether there's this um, magic threshold where people can say, well, this is okay and this should be taken care of. But maybe we should even subdivide it in more than that. Right? Maybe we should say high priority and medium priority and low priority and fine. Yeah. We're we're looking at that. Yeah, but so you, 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 if I understand it correctly, you you will actually also be able to detect when different programmers had sat on different times, edited their code and didn't read about the code. The others read just added some extra stuff because then you have the different style of coding, like you said new definition of the same thing or new thing uh, and that, may, maybe that, that is likely to happen yeah although so we are not looking at but style, maybe those, those but we're looking at words yeah so if you're using um but then if that's not yeah 
let's, let's and, and this may be a stupid example, but mm -hmm. if you're using like interest rates throughout your program and then all of a sudden switch to the Dutch again, then that would count as a new word. Yeah. Uh, and that would signif well, signal a change in style, as you yeah. would call it, and maybe also a reason to start a refactor. Yeah. But actually what we're trying to do is we're also trying to use a dictionary to see whether they're yeah. just using uh, a synonym, because yeah. that might also be uh, interesting. And might also be interesting to find out which of the 50% is picked up. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we haven't done so, but yeah. it's a good suggestion, absolutely. Yeah. And and what we and might also be cross repository. What what uh, what we see now uh, is that uh, we have um, uh, micro uh, uh, deliveries, mm -hmm. uh, but we also see uh, smaller repositories, mm -hmm. but with equal type of code. And actually, seeing that people are not using an, uh, one method and using them in multiple repositories, uh, but actually copying the code. Yeah. Of course, copying code is easy to detect, but yeah. No, it could definitely be something uh, to, be, to be looked at. Now, um, specifically on the point that you're saying, with these smaller repositories and people copying code between repositories, I know that people in Germany have actually looked at that. And uh, they were looking specifically on GitHub Mm -hmm. And they've, I, I don't know the exact percentage, but they found a lot of code to be copied between projects. So there's a lot of this copy-pasting going on. Yeah. And it's not simply including a library, it's really just yeah, simply blatantly copying some code that yeah. seems to be useful and good. So, yes. Um, so, two situations, the metric-based style, the more intuitive style. Uh, well, this is the explanation that I already gave. It seems I didn't really use my slides here. Um, but what we saw is actually that this is far more likely to be refactored throughout history. But we also talked to 15 software engineers and we showed them, look, this is a smell detected and another smell detected. We didn't tell them how we detected them, but we asked them to rate those two, those two detected smells on a severity scale. And almost all people said that the intuitively uh, discovered uh, smell is more bad, is more in need of refactoring. It hinders them more during their development than something that was detected with metrics. Um, well, that's on this slide. So some thoughts. Um, we have an intuition as engineers, and I'm just placing myself among the engineers right now, uh, to measure everything. I think that's healthy. Uh, it's good. Um, we want to make estimations. We, know, we want to know how we're spending our time, and we want to know whether we're, we're on track or whether we need to improve. So those are all good things, and those are things that we should keep on doing. Um, yet, even if you're blinded, if, you, if you're blind and you don't look at the numbers, intuition is also very good because intuition can explain what needs to be done with the numbers, whether, whether there's a severity level to the numbers and so on. So the urgency does not come from the numbers. The urgency comes from the intuition, from knowing what should be done and knowing what should be done first and so on. So that's where this slide comes from. Data and intuition, that's where the real good decisions come from. So we can do all the software analytics that we want, but if we're not there, if, if there's nobody there to interpret them and to give some intuitive feeling to them, oh, we're not there yet. So, the big takeaways. Uh, well, this slide, we just discussed it. There's a lot of folklore going on. And if you switch companies and you say, well, we used to do it like that and it seemed good, that's very strong, but it's also something that you should be careful uh, about, right? Because maybe in your new company, things are different. Different culture, different people, different programming language, different industry, I don't know, take care about it. Estimation, wow, really difficult, especially if you don't like the particular task. So I don't like dishes, I told you, I spent two hours. My wife doesn't believe me. Uh, if you want to know more, you have uh, to give it in ten, right? 
Yes, obviously. <laughs> if you want to know more, uh, contact me over Twitter, email ball. You can find. There's also a nice TEDx uh, Delft talk from two years ago on pretty much uh, also the testing topic, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. And we're done a bit early, but there's still time for discussion. Are you also working on incorporating your metric if it's uh, ready uh, in, in Lint uh, software so that developers will actually get if it naturally possible, yes. in their tooling? If possible, yes. Um, but I also have to uh, make a disclaimer here. We can do it for six smells right now. And implementing it, we're implementing it for more smells. And I think we want first to establish a kind of broader basis that this is not just uh, working for a few smells, but this is working more broadly before we uh, go on. We have an implementation. So if we would want to incorporate it, it wouldn't be such a hassle. Uh, but we're not there yet. This is early stage research still. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I thought maybe you get more data than in that sense. People simply running it on their open source projects with, uh, with that implementation automatically. Like you have the right big brother mindset, absolutely. <laughs> no, no, you're right, you're right. Abs uh, it, it would be helpful for us, it would probably also be helpful for them, but we're not there yet. Okay. No. Any other questions, or are you just really thirsty and want to go for drinks? <laughs> now, what yes. is the real problem? What is the real problem? Yeah. Well, I mean, did you capture, <laughs> did, do you have a feeling that you captured the real problem? Because I see you really focusing on the developers only. Yes. Is that, is that correct? Uh, my well, I'm, uh, that is correct. Uh, I think of myself as a really technical person, so I, I like to make my hands dirty with code. And so my problem is that both for myself and a lot of other people are asking me, how much should I spend on testing? How much time should I spend on testing? <laughs> and well, obviously, as the good researcher, I say it depends. But that's not—I mean, that's not what I can tell my students, or that's not what I can tell uh, tell my company contacts. Um, so that's where this, this this question came from, and where I wanted to know: well, what are people doing? And so one thing that I am—I haven't said yet, and I'm also not going to give you that answer—is how much should I be spending? Because the honest answer is, even though we spend lots of energy and resources on, on establishing this, this, I can honestly say to you, well, apparently 25%, well, it's like 28% of time should be spent on testing. Would you be, would you feel safe that if, like, a software for a nuclear power plant is tested 28%? No. No. Well, we, um, I also wouldn't yeah, be. No. So, <laughs> it, it still depends, right? So it, it's difficult. Uh, I think I want people to realize that uh, measuring is important. Yeah, it I think, yeah. Yeah, I was, uh, I think that's the, I, I get that question, the same question, because everything we do, because we're in the financial business, is measured in money. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so how much time is actually, how much money do I need to reserve so that people uh, can work on the value and because testing is no value, right? So uh, it is, but they don't see. So um, uh, what actually they don't ask, but they should, for my opinion, is when should we test and how, what and how? Mm -hmm. um, um, and, and then it should also be uh, logical in, in the flow of uh, bringing uh, business value. Yes. Uh, and uh, I think if, if for some, um, in some way we can help that transformation uh, in mindset, I think that will help the, the code quality a lot. So if, if I, I, I agree, but if there's one uh, term that I definitely agree with is that mindset. And yeah. people are extremely easily satisfied with, yeah. I produce the code, it r works for me, but <laughs> I haven't tested it. But it works for me, so it's fine. Yeah, it's on my laptop, it works. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. And so and, uh, I can tell you um, one anecdote, uh, and I, I won't name the company, 
Um, but I had an intern uh, working at also a financial company. It's not yours. Um, and he comes to me very proud and he says, I found a bug in the system. Uh, uh, he said, well, it's incredible because I'm, I'm working in a team of more than 20 people and I'm the only one that, that, that sees this bug and apparently the bug was already in the system for more than a year. Um, so uh, he says, what should I do? And I said, well, talk to your manager or talk to your direct supervisor at the company and explain to him why you think it's a bug and, and maybe propose a solution or, or something. So he, happy, proud, goes to his manager and a few days later, he reports back to me and he said, well, well you're, no, you're not happy. And he says, no, because I made my manager angry. I said, why? He says, well, my manager said, well, I would, he explicitly said to the student, I would rather not have known about this bug because now I have to reschedule everything. So this manager, apparently the mindset was like, leave me alone, I don't want to know about this bug, but, but because it, it hurts me, right? It hurts my project then and the manager of the manager will be unhappy because he couldn't finish the functionality that had to be delivered that week and so on and so on mm -hmm. but i mean the other the other side is there's a bug in a system that transfers money right or, or that, that does something with your money and would you be happy sp or, or putting money in into that well i'm not going to say the company but that you entrust something to that company that doesn't care about whether it's right or not, whether it's correct or not? Well, I, I wouldn't. Even as a software engineer, that is, that, and I, I know that there are mind-blowing many possibilities for failure, but if the mindset is wrong, and, and you say, I would rather not want to know about this bug, well, then, then I think that's something that we should make the next generation of software engineers mm, well the next generation of people the managers, who think managers. It. i think oh, yes <laughs> yeah 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 i think the problem is at a level higher so it's not just the uh, really software engineers yeah. so if, <laughs> if you consider um, because i i see software engineers that ex es escalated for two years on uh, each month about uh, needs they have to improve mm. uh, having a, a test server, having a mock server, etc. Uh, but only when I came up and say, oh yes, of course, they got it. Yeah. And then uh, managers were asking, why are they so happy now? I said, I just, I just say okay to 10,000 euros. They are happy because of this small thing? Yeah, yeah so they didn't understand. It was the most important thing. It kept them uh, every three weeks for one week, not not be able to yeah. do the stuff they need. So, so yes, but so I think it, I feel like it's my mission to start somewhere. And yeah. If I can instill this into the next generation of software engineers, then maybe it gets to companies and it gets to the more general management and so on. And maybe that's where things start to change. And maybe also at the technical bestuurs yeah. technical. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that we that should start there as well. Yeah. Yeah. If they let me, I will. But yes. I'm not sure whether they will. <laughs> <laughs> and if they get to the, yeah, and it's also mindset, that, that's the hard thing. Yeah. I think it's also uh, maybe very naive uh, uh, response, but I think it's, you need to see it before you believe it. And you need to see what can go wrong before you realize yeah. what needs to be done. And yeah, even with 80 fucks uh, problems, you don't get uh, companies that are having the same issues to fix it. Yes. Even but if that's in... So, so my belief, and again, maybe very naive, is that if you're a software engineer, from day one, you see things going wrong, right? You see your compiler complaining at you, Right? That goes wrong, right? So my students say, yeah, what, what should I do if the, the compiler complains? I say, well, read what it says and then try to go from there. Uh, but if you don't see that and you just believe that ma that software is this magical thing that is always working even without... And it's always too expensive. And it's it? always too expensive, too late, then, and, yeah. then obviously you're, you're always going to say no to, um, to making this extra investment for a CI server or something. But, um, I mean, this was on, on social media over the last weeks and months even. Um, 
I think what um, this judge in the United States did with this engineer from Volkswagen is actually a pretty good thing. Well, not for the software engineer. But what happened is that the software engineer that worked on the diesel engines that were uh, uh, caught in the whole scandal was actually convicted. And he, he goes to jail now. And it's not only the manager. So I think this also sends a very strong signal, like you as a software engineer, you are responsible. And here it was only a mission, but next time, like, like with the, the, the Dodge Ram, it, it's about human lives. So even if your boss says to you, well, we're not going to do the tests for this nuclear plant and the nuclear plant explodes, it's not only the boss that, that can go to jail, it's also you. So in a way, and I know it's easier said than done, but maybe as software engineers, we should also step up and say, no, this is not how I can write good software. And I know it's easier said than done, but we need to start somewhere. But you often see that the people, the lowest in rank, go in pr to prison, and the highest in rank never go to prison. I'm not a judge. So <laughs> you have this ethical uh, example for the, the challenger where the guy at the bottom who finally agreed, the engineer who was pushed by the management to uh, keep the uh, shoot and that they yep. should launch the Challenger in 1986. That he was the one to blame and was fired. And actually, the yeah, guys sitting at the high position, they were not. And they were not. They were not. And yeah, I consider also from yeah, aerospace, which is my background. Uh, you have this new Airbus, the A400, mm -hmm. which is also a software glitch, which caused this crash in Spain. And well, now I hear discussions from, oh, we're going to look at the probability that might something go uh, is going wrong instead of fixing the problem. <laughs> so, oh, the probability is probably smaller. <laughs> well, will you... <laughs> so th there's a movie, Kramer versus Kramer. <laughs> I, I, I go again with my movies, but um, it's about a father and a daughter, both uh, lawyers, and one represents the car company and the other... Uh, some people of which uh, a relative died because of a car crash and the car was designed in, in a wrong way that if there was an accident at a certain angle the car would explode and it comes out that the car company knew and they were just doing bean counting they said how many complaints how many car accidents will there be how many car accidents at that right angle that the car explodes and if that happens then we'll just uh, settle the court cases and how much does that cost us versus hmm. fixing the real problem? And I think that is something that is also very much an issue in, in software. Yeah. People are thinking, okay, well, okay, the uh, app from company X fails, to, uh, fails on me like every week, fine, nobody will run away, because we have a monopoly anyway. Um, but that's not, I mean, that's not how it should be done. I agree. But yeah, if you look at reality, quite often it's, it's uh, yeah, management. <coughs> it's different. It's different. Um, Within aviation, they say, well, 750 uh, people should die before we start to solve a problem, which is really sad. Yeah, or yeah. someone simply said, well, uh, it's my my bonus is tied to having this release mm -hmm. in in April. So mm -hmm. sorry, yeah, it has to go live. No matter what. The most important yeah. thing. I no think. matter yeah. what. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they are, of course, not literally saying it's my bonus. Yeah. Bah. yeah. But that's reality. Or his credibility, he said it to the whole uh, higher management hierarchy, yeah. and he wants to step up soon. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he cannot, I agree. Yeah, that, that's cannot uh, yeah. have a failure. Well, it's not a failure, mm -hmm. uh, from my perspective. If you would say, hey, we need more time because we didn't, uh, well, etc. Well, apparently Apple can do it if they uh, launched uh, HomePod later, so it can be done. Would it perhaps also help to incorporate testing in an earlier phase of development? That you would already put it much more in a design phase? Oh, yes. So, from my point of view, yes. It's lacking, so... It's and that's also what I'm... So, students, they come to TU Delft September 1st, and like three weeks later, I will not be accepting any of their solutions if there are no tests. But again, this, this needs a change in mindset. And if you look in literature, and this is not only in, in, in software engineering, right, but people are overly confident. And people, um, 
they say, oh, well, I'm, I'm just writing like five lines of code right now just to try out something, right? And then, hey, works. Okay, let, let's start building on this and let's add five more lines. And then all of a sudden you have a thousand no lines of code and you have no tests. <laughs> but actually the real good mindset should be, hey, I have five lines of code. Let's test it before I work further on it. And that is, I, I think that goes a bit in the direction of what you're saying, right? It, it should be done like automatically and kind of in parallel to development. And there is, I mean, or, or on, from an organizational standpoint, for, uh, for I work at DAF, mm -hmm. and even though DAF is not really a da data intensive company or data oriented or data anything, <laughs> um, well, you're here we, for we, data, we, right? We, so. we're, we're growing that way. Um, but the, the, the fact that more and more cars have more software implies that you are also going to be more related to this kind of software testing. However, the automotive industry for decades uh, has focused a lot on just the testing of the vehicle as a whole in terms of safety and all sorts of things. And from 10 or 15 years now, at that one of the things that happened is that the vehicle testing department, actually performing physical tests on the car, uh, are not alone in doing these things. There are some other departments who work also in virtual testing, and there is this sort of love hate relationship where both departments are checking on the other, uh, trying to disprove mm -hmm. that they're also, uh, but by the end, it, it, it's a tense environment. But it, so far, it has worked out. And each site finds different things. And uh, yeah, hopefully, that should improve the, the, the quality. Of the I think this is a really realistic option to do it like that, right? I mean, one checks the other, and that's, that's how it should be. And if I can add one anecdote mm -hmm. to the, the automotive industry, um, I'm not sure which company it was, but um, there was a company developing self-driving cars uh, in California, and they were putting these cars on the road to test them. Uh, so everything went fine, uh, cars drove around, but in the town where, um, or, or the area where the car was tested, there were not that many bikers. I mean, like <laughs> in the United States, most people drive a car, right? <laughs> now, uh, then this company said, let's try to go ahead with our testing and let's do it in more uh, in other areas so they put uh, this self-driving car in San Francisco now one thing that happens in San Francisco is people bike so what happens there this car is driving and it makes a right turn but the software was not designed to also detect bikers so what happens well the bike uh, and the car collided um, so so all I'm saying is that this particular scenario was simply not envisaged, envisaged in the tests. Uh, because where the car was developed, bikers were not an issue. So it's good that somebody else is still checking. And I think that that but, would work. Yeah, and, and I think this also comes back to, to two points. One of them is this test case or use case uh, things that I mentioned uh, yeah. so, some yeah. time ago. Uh, because indeed, uh, when you have a uh, vehicle or a physical system and you want to design this for a certain set of average situations, it's going to be very difficult that you actually release this thing into the world and that you are going to face exactly the situations that you uh, described. Mm -hmm. that, so it's going to be difficult to test in a real world environment. And the other thing is that uh, one of the difficulties that, for example, we are finding is that designing these sort of, we call them functional tests uh, for uh, functional safety oriented mm -hmm. systems. Uh, when you are a mechanical engineer and you have not been trained in this whole testing uh, philosophy from a software standpoint, and you are moving more and more towards that, there, there is a challenge in education, for yes. example, also. Yes. And yeah, so that, that's, uh, there is room for improvement. Uh, amen to that. Uh, so I, I think also the earlier discussion on education maybe was a bit more oriented from my side that I'm, I'm looking at these, the, this fresh generation of students, but again also people that are on the market or, or that are retrained from, from another discipline into a more software oriented discipline, they would also benefit from, uh, from this kind of... Yeah, maybe we have this idea of software oriented, but for example mechanical engineers will have a 
lots of uh, uh, test methodologies and philosophies, mm -hmm. but the, the fundamental way of working is a little bit different from when you go to virtual systems or software-based yeah. systems. Yeah. And uh, yeah, hmm. it's, it's in, in interesting because. In mechanical testing, right? They actually design the, the the elements to be more robust to resist the test, right? So, so the thing you you design uh, uh, is more robust than your test can fail it, or or just in some times they they do do harder than they will ever face in reality. Yeah. But in software. Yes, but that, so that's that's actually a very nice. Thing, mm -hmm. I think so. So the, the 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 quality of those people, that if that if you can bring that to uh, to software testing, uh, and in in translate to make that. things more resilient than they need yes. to be. Yes. Yes. So, and if so if, if, if you have a design I pattern uh, in in software de development uh, to make uh, uh, a mechanical testing like resilience, uh, roll of uh, thumb and stuff like that, that that might even actually help in, in, in your code quality, of in your, your well, software well, quality, actually, I mean. Hmm? Depends on the requirements. No. Yeah, I the, the, guy, uh, the guy has a point. Uh, I'm a lecturer in uh, the AQ University in uh, industrial automation. And my experience is that uh, the, the, the technical uh, uh, department who makes the hardware uh, often uh, on, on, on paper it looks uh, very nice, but in practice uh, uh, the software engineer has to uh, remove a lot of failures. Uh, and then your software, uh, is, is the, 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 the use cases for the software are uh, not sophisticated anymore. Yeah. Maybe also because, and I might be naive because I'm, I'm, I'm not a mechanical engineer or not in the automotive domain, but if you design uh, a wishbone of a car to be um, stronger than necessarily needed, I mean, how do you define that for software? Uh, there's so many things that can, can go wrong in software, so maybe you should say, well, are you going to cover like 80% of the, the things that can go wrong in software? Are you going to cover those? While for a wishbone, yeah, maybe there are only, I don't know, but maybe there are only so many things that can go wrong, so maybe it's easier to go for this extra resilience uh, in these well, they, they Yes, I totally agree, I but th there are still cases. For example, some years ago we had a problem with the fuel tanks, mm -hmm. and uh, we had customers in Russia that uh, apparently fuel tanks had some sort of problem, mm -hmm. and several months into the matter it turned out that in some regions of the country the weather was just so cold that truck drivers used to turn some fire below the fuel tank yeah. to warm it up. And yeah, that was not ideal. And when you are trying to design a, a use case for these things and trying to predict this sort of mechanical uh, uh, I get whatever. Your point. I get your point. Yeah, you, you cannot predict some things. Point taken. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Wow, I, I, don't think I would go with, with what you just said with the requirements. A good set of requirements, like good determined requirements, good defined specific requirements will help in the end for a good system design and in the end for a good system test. If you know exactly where you're heading to, you can test for that. I've been a software engineer myself, now I see it a bit above that and I, I see a bit from above and I remember a software engineer, I would just get lost. I would start, as you say, I would start working one day and 10 hours afterwards I would say, I didn't test anything today, I just created 100 more lines of code, and here we are right now. Right and uh, yeah, I didn't have actually an insight of furthermore, and they would tell me, yeah, just write a, a document to document what you are actually coding. Yeah, it's boring. And then when you sit one step above, you're saying, wow, I don't know what they're doing. I, I really have no idea. It's two days now, and I, I, I don't know what's you happening here. For sure, yes. Anyway. Exactly. I also think that sometimes they, not being involved in the design phase, like the problem that some people don't know that much about software, or, or like separating the management, the design part, or the, the, the requirement, the user defined requirements part from the, the developer, and the developer separated as well from the wishes of the clients. This separation between the both of them makes it actually one, one people wants to do one thing and the other people wishes for something else, and it's actually a lack of communication what's happening in the middle sometimes. It's just not even like lack of knowledge or lack of education. Yeah, 
it's lack of not being uh, setting the right mm -hmm. people in one room together and uh, talking about it. That's yeah. what Agile is supposed to help. Yes, <laughs> but then they introduce, yeah, but we had this role in, in the past, so we have to facilitate this role in the, in the Agile. Of course, it's not. But yeah, they, they introduce, so we have product owners of product owners, and we have uh, business information uh, analysts in the Scrum team that first analyze everything, and then the developer starts. Developer never talks to the business, there it goes, uh, <laughs> there it goes bankrupt.